All right, how's it going, everybody? Thank you all for coming out, and thank you, Sabat and Hannah, for the lovely uh, introduction. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, my name is Jake Alterman, and my project is called Nice Skis, which is some product design that I did over the last semester. Um, so a little bit about myself. Oops. A little bit about myself. Uh, I've lived in Minnesota my entire life, pretty much my entire life, and I've also been skiing since uh, about the age of four, thanks to my parents. They took me out to New Mexico and just threw me right on the hill at a really young age. So thank you guys for that. Um, it kind of changed my life. Um, so yeah, I al I've also taught skiing for about six years now. So it's a really big passion of mine, and it's just a really big part of my life. So when it t came time to choose uh, a senior project, I wanted to incorporate skiing somehow into this. So I decided to kind of start my own ski brand. Um, and every brand kind of needs something that makes it unique. So I started by uh, just kind of mocking up some different logos, just kind of how I wanted the brand to feel. And this is just kind of an example of how I work, just kind of throw a bunch of stuff on an artboard. And uh, the feelings that I wanted to convey with this brand were kind of just free, wild, fun, loose, and it's just kind of communicate how I feel when I, when I am skiing. And I think that anybody who can who plays any sort of sport or does any physical activity can kind of resonate with that. Um, so yeah. So after I got all the branding done, I thought about kind of making my own skis. And I started doing a lot of research on what kind of would go into making my own skis. And I uh, spent pretty much all winter break thinking about that. And the more research I did, the more kind of unrealistic it looked. Uh, Price-wise and budget or time-wise, it just didn't really seem that realistic. So I kind of took a step back and scaled back, which is something that Shelgren kind of told us we might need to do. He warned us about it pretty early on in the process. So I took a step back and I rethought about how I wanted to present uh, my skis. So I decided to do them in Autodesk Maya, which is the program that's offered free uh, to students through Autodesk, which is a really great company. Um, it's a 3D modeling program and it's something I have a little bit of experience with. Um, I did some 3D modeling and 3D printing last year with Ma. And it's, it's really fun. I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. It's challenging, but um, it's very rewarding at the same time. So I spent a good portion of the semester just kind of playing with rendering these skis out, making sure everything looked right, and also researching like what I wanted my skis to be technically. So um, just kind of working through that process, getting everything looking right, uh, lighting. You can see a lot of things change here. Um, so yeah. And uh, the last thing that I thought about was kind of how I wanted to present these things. And I initially thought I wanted to just kind of frame like maybe some 10 by 10 renderings um, and throw them on the gallery wall nice and simple that make it look really neat. Um, but then my friend Luke Sandman and I were eating out at Great, Great Hunan over on 3rd Street one day and he kind of gave me the really nice idea to maybe print them out to scale so people can kind of see exactly what they would look like. and. Uh, just make it make it seem a little bit more realistic and it's just kind of like one step away from actually having physical objects in the gallery so that's kind of what the final product looks like uh, some two nice to scale renderings of these skis and uh, that's about it uh, hope you guys can check it out in the gallery it, I'm pretty proud of it uh, it was a lot of fun working through this process um, and maybe look for them on the hill one day we'll see and uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Dayton Cotton. Hello, everybody. I'm Dayton Cotton, and uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit about what I have in the gallery. Um, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about myself. So I did, um, I've been born and raised in Minnesota, so I'm pretty used to being around here. And uh, what I really like to do is kind of draw that's kind of what I've been working on for the past couple of years here at Winona State. So, working on a lot of like technical drawings and more realistic drawings, but I feel like for this um, project, I need to go towards the digital side, being a designer and all. So, what I really wanted to do was kind of create a couple of posters in a rotoscope fashion. Basically, what Chip Berry does, I really admire his work and would like to kind of see my work kind of progress that way someday. And, uh, just using basically a couple of three colors and more just shapes than anything else to create the object or subject you are wanting to make. So I wanted to kind of poke fun and evoke some emotions in some people with some like 
sort of political, not so much, but just kind of uh, things that people say you kind of see sometimes on the internet. And uh, just make like a type graphic layout with uh, text and then illustration using Rotoscope. So I picked out a few different of the people I thought I'd like to do. Um, fame to shame was my topic. And kind of like people that were at the top at one point and then have either gone downhill real quick or just a lot of people view them as going downhill. So I picked out a couple of people that I thought were were the best for that option. And really it was going to be a lot more in the beginning, like more pieces in the gallery, but I found out I didn't have the time to do that. So I stuck it down to three instead of five. I was going to do two other pieces, which were installations. So kind of ran out of time with that, but I think I'm pretty proud of what I've turned out so far. So I'd like to introduce now uh, Chris Hatcher. All right, I'd first like to thank you guys for coming out and making the trip down to Winona. Um, my name is Christopher Hatcher, and a little bit of history about me is I'm from South Minneapolis. Um, I've lived there my entire life. And uh, my project is called Fate Loves the Fearless. And um, one of the things that inspired me is basketball and my love for basketball. So um, starting my project, I started off with doing a lot of drafting and a lot of um, sketches. And I think that sketches are one thing that can boost your creativity. And that's one thing that I like to focus on a lot. Um, it's a sort of brainstorming for, um, for designers. And I like to call it uh, getting the juices flowing. So this is kind of what I do. And if you see, there's uh, sketches of my actual um, uh, 3D display that I wanted to make. And then there's also other sketches of just like doodles and stick people. And that's just uh, random thoughts racing through my head while I'm um, actually creating these drawings. Um, from there, I'd like to go into inspiration. Um, a lot of my inspiration for this project came from uh, my three-month summer that I spent back home in Minneapolis, uh, working at an internship and uh, also playing basketball the entire summer. Um, my internship consisted of uh, watching people, um, working and watching people um, work on 3D displays for in-store um, mock-ups, such as Foot Locker, um, Nike, um, foot Finish Line, as well as Champs. And so that gave me a big inspiration on trying to go big. And this is actually one of their displays that they offered me to take home as well. And it sits in my room. And it's just a reminder that every day that I leave to go big and every time I come home, uh, ask a question to myself of, did you go big? And if you didn't, then go bigger tomorrow. And so that's just the inspiration that I have um, thus far. Um, from there, I went on to pursuing the process and finding the outcome. So here you can see that my drafts have gotten a little bit, um, a little bit more, a little bit better. So I've added displays and how I would like to display my artwork and there's three different displays. So I'm just working around how I can um, use my gallery space um, wisely and how I can fit my project so that um, it can be viewed nicely as well as the other pieces around it. Um, this is one of the e easiest stages for me because it's right before I get into the digital work and that's when the real grind comes, I guess, and trying to put in time um, and make your designs uh, good and flawless. So from there, I go to um, another part of the process. Um, due to plagiarism issues, uh, you have to kind of create your own image. And so here is me going through 20 to 30 images of one uh, individual player and cutting them out. And here's the next stage. So you can see how I cut out the uh, shoes, the arms, I cut out the heads, and I just kind of just chopped up all these pieces in order to make one uh, valid design. And so this is uh, the process that I go through off of the computer, and then from here I would scan this into the computer and then generate a design from this. Um, after this, this is, um, was going to be a throwaway portion of my project, but I actually found a way uh, to incorporate them. Uh, the reason why I use these specific people is, for one, they are inspiration to me and uh, the things that they do inspire me to work harder. And not only that, but they also, my project has to do with the uh, NBA. And so these are uh, partial owners of teams. So the first one is Drake, and he's a young 
up and coming star and he inspires me to work hard even while you're young um, and he also owns part of the Raptors next is I'd like to say like the best couple in the world which is Jay-Z and Beyonce <laughs> and together they're worth a billion dollars separately 500 million and they're a good inspiration to me um, because they're a young slash old couple and, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so it just inspires me to work hard until the end and then lastly Spike Lee um, he's an actor, a movie director, and also attends every single New York Knicks game, and also has a portion of the, them as well. And he actually created one of my uh, favorite movies, which is He Got Game, which stars Denzel Washington and uh, Ray Allen of the Miami Heat. And so I watch that movie, I'd say, like once a month at least, but I'd say it's a pretty good movie, and if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Um, from there, I give you a preview a slight preview of what my design actually looks like. Um, you probably don't know the players, but uh, to the far left, we have Kevin, Dur Kevin Durant of the Oklahoma City Thunder. Then next we have LeBron James of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And finally we have Kobe Bryant of the Los Angeles Lakers. And these players all inspire me as well um, with their hard work and dedication that they put onto the court every single night. And it also relates to my title of the piece, which is Fate Loves the Fearless and they uh, tackled their fate by chasing it the only way they knew how to, and that's by putting in hard work. So that's what I try to do as well. Um, so thank you, and next I would like to introduce Kaylee O'Neill. Okay, so as Chris mentioned, my name is Kaylee O'Neill, and I'm the designer behind Fostering Felines, A Tale of Mixed Emotions. I've been lucky enough to have a number of great inspirations for this piece, including an experience I had this fall, some incredible designers, as well as support from friends, family, mentors, and colleagues. For those of you who may not know me as well, let me back up a little bit. <laughs> so, growing up, I've always loved animals. Whether it was playing in the backyard with a family dog, or starting my own business cleverly named Kaylee's Cool Pet Care, um, or even being featured in the local newspaper for raising supplies and awareness for the Dane County Humane Society. Fast forwarding about a decade later, as you can see, I've grown and changed quite a bit. And one thing that has always stayed the same is my love and passion for animals. This fall, I had the opportunity to foster two great cats through the Winona Humane Society, Chi Chi, who's on the right, and then Sneakers, who is on the left. And when I first heard about the opportunity, I was so excited, couldn't wait to you know, jump in, lend a hand. And over the following months, we definitely had an interesting array of different interactions, I guess. And through this, I really learned a lot. And ultimately, due to the amount of travel I was doing, long nights in the lab, which many of us here in the room can relate to, and a busier than ever schedule, I learned that at this point in time, I'm not quite ready for a pet in my life. I was in the midst of sorting through the many emotions that went along with what to do with these fuzzy, adorable little cute guys um, when our senior exhibition proposal was due. So, thus I came to the conclusion that sharing my experience, and by doing this, I really hope to inspire others to consider fostering as well. As being at a point where I really, really wanted my own pet, this gave me the opportunity to test it out with really low risk experience. And then moving on, I wanted to talk about two designers that I've actually had the opportunity to personally meet and who really inspire me. First is Jessica Hish. For those who know her, she has impeccable illustration skills, hand lettering, and she's like the queen of design side projects. And she's a bright and young designer who's worked with Starbucks, Penguin Books, and Nordstrom's, just to name a few. Next is Debbie Millman, who is more of a seasoned veteran. She's worked at Spectrum Brands in New York for over a decade now. And she recently released a Skillshare class online titled The Art of the Story, Creating Visual Narratives. And she really inspired me by kind of the way she crafted these narratives in different sections to put together the story. 
I hope that you have the opportunity to check out my work in the gallery and all of the interesting experiences that I went through with Chi Chi and sneakers, as well as reflect on if fostering is something that would be a good fit for you to try. I know that I found it to be a truly rewarding experience and irreplaceable at the same time. Lastly, I would like to thank all of my incredible team members because I definitely could have done, couldn't have done this without you. And I know that we all have very different styles and workflows, but that's something that really helped teach me a lot. And next up is Luke Sandman. Hello everyone, my name is Luke Sandeman, and um, for my piece I, de I decided to choose to create a short animated music video using the Adobe After Effects software which is provided through Nona State. Um, first I would like to talk about the influences that impacted the work such as space and time, music, color, shapes, and uh, the famous artist Frank Stella. So this image right here kind of represents um, how kind of represents how I fancy celestial things like time and space travel and um, you know the, the stars and depth of field. I play a lot of I played a lot of that stuff in a lot of my previous work as well as in this animation. Um, this statement right here is pretty solid. I feel music is life. Um, much of the work much of my work revolves around music. I travel a lot. I go to a lot of music festivals. I go to a lot of shows and um, I feel when I go to these places, I experience a wide variety of different cultures. I pull ideas from these experiences that have been incubating within, within me for quite some time. Um, to me, music is the vessel of creativity. So I listen to a lot of music when I design. And a lot of my stuff has been designed based off, I guess, kind of the songs that I'm currently listening to and whatnot. Um, next slide. This right here is kind of just symbolizes the color palette that I kind of, kind of was trying to mimic and go with throughout my animation. It's not quite as vibrant, but I kind of wanted to keep it to being um, a more singular color palette than having a wide variety of different things. I didn't want a bunch of colors to kind of overburden the rest of the animation. Right here is a piece done by Frank Stella, and I really enjoy this piece a lot because I feel it mimics a lot of my my style, I do a lot of stuff with geom geometric shapes, color, and stuff like that. So I feel this is a really good piece that kind of, kind of symbolizes who I am as a designer. Here's another piece done by Stella. Again, it's the color, the repetition, kind of like the gestalt going from one panel to the next, as well as you know the, sat the unsaturated image over there to the right. These right here, um, I really like a lot. This right here is a piece done by Frank Stella as well. In my animation, I do a lot of um, line pulsating work, and this kind of mimics the line weight that I use in some aspects of the animation that I hope you guys will take a look at. Just another brief image of that. And then lastly, Trapper Keepers was kind of an inspiration for the animation. I feel that in my group, I'm, I was definitely the oldest one, and I don't think anyone else ever used Trapper Keepers besides me. So this was something that kind of I drew inspiration from with just the colors and just um, you know some weird abstract stuff going on. And I feel that was a good foundation of where my animation derived from. And then next I will be introducing Jonathan Tubbs. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm John Tubbs. Uh, for those of you who know me, this really comes as no surprise, but uh, for those of you who don't, um, my interests include uh, walking on the beach, uh, walking around the lake here in Winona. Um, I also enjoy um, a lot of really edgy themes in graphic design and art, uh, such as graffiti, tattoos, pretty much anything that makes people kind of cringe when they first hear it. So I find those ideas and themes really fascinating and what they do to cause those reactions to people. Um, obviously, I like tattoos a lot. Um, I think this kind of sums up the idea and the visual that people get when they first hear the word tattoo. 
Um, they kind of see a burly man, you know, mean looking, but he's just got this crazy weird skull on his chest just for no reason. Just other than he wants to be bad, you know. So um, I've always been fascinated with tattoos ever since high school. Um, I always did designs for my friends just for fun, sketches here and there. And so when it came time to decide on what I should do for a show, I obviously wanted to open up my own tattoo parlor. Um, I've been studying tattoos uh, really intensely for the last couple of years, and I've been learning a lot about their symbolism and their meaning, and getting really into like the deeper, I guess, into the skin of the tattoo, you know, getting to the deeper, lower layers. So upon doing my research, obviously, I came across tattoos that are both insanely detailed and have like super duper crazy meaning to that specific person. Um, obviously, when they began um, back in the day, they were more used as markers of criminals. Um, a lot of like convicts would get them to show like how mean they were and where they're from and why you should fear them. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, a lot of the new tattoos that are coming out today are insanely detailed and are just amazing work. There's a lot of crazy good artists out there who are creating work that is beyond what anyone had, uh, could even imagine at the beginning. This is uh, a picture that I found that really um, gets into like the, me the deeper meaning that I wanted to uh, convey with my show is uh, more of like a sailor, uh, vintage, you know, travel the world type of person, like, and getting the meaning of those tattoos and what they mean to those individuals. Now, any tattoo parlor needs some sort of branding or some sort of sign or some sort of image. So with this, I really got into, um, recently I got into like hand lettering and, um, typography and like really, really like vintage looking um, wordplay. And so when it came time to, um, I guess, design my sign, I went with this drawing that I had drawn up uh, two summers ago, actually. It was just a one-off day where I was just sitting around my apartment going, what should I do today? I guess I'll draw a picture. So I uh, came up with this idea just as like, a what if type of thing of what I would call my own tattoo shop if I were to open it and it is a wild side tattoo um, so to make the sign I um, brought the, that image this image into Photoshop and I created kind of like a um, separate layers of like the banner and the star and the tattoo and all the different letters and I made them into separate um, stencils that I could then use to um, create a sign. Um, now to do that, I used uh, what's called masonite, which is basically really thick, thick, thick paper. Um, I, this was generously donated to me by uh, the Boathouse, a restaurant that's over by the levee here in Winona. Um, it's just a really simple piece of board. Um, I used a jigsaw just to cut out the basic shape and get the all the angles right. Um, I don't have a exactly a picture of the process of the spray paint, which regrettably I do not have. But to create the letters, I cut out each one individually uh, from the masonite, uh, spray painted it white, and then laid a black vinyl on top to create kind of like the, uh, the deeper shadow effect that it, that it kind of has. Um, to hang the sign, I just used uh, L brackets on either wall and then strung a cord to the back of the sign so it just hangs directly at a 45 degree angle right in the corner. Now originally when I had um, planned on doing this show, I knew exactly where I wanted to be in the gallery. I knew I wanted to be in the corner and that was gonna be my corner that I owned and everyone was gonna know that I was there. So um, yeah, so I did that. Now uh, for the, <laughs> for the uh, tattoos themselves, I wanted to uh, represent uh, my um, progress as an artist in this field. So I wanted to start with uh, first a page that represented uh, symbols that were really easily like, like they're really easy to understand. They're, yeah, they're not, um, they're not hard to understand. They're really just, they are what they are. 
Um, then I wanted to create a page that uh, started getting into like letters and typography and like more meaningful um, types of designs. Uh, for the third page, I wanted to um, dive into the history of tattoos and like the visual like uh, symbolism that like the sailors had and then combine all of those into my own designs for the last page. So combining both visual imagery and uh, typography imagery and kind of playing with those in a fun way. So this is a nice little example. Uh, this is my friend Hannah Sung. She does not sleep because she is always in the lab, always. So she was one of the first people to get the tattoo, uh, temporary tattoo that I had set up. And it's a nice little low battery. So I thought that was very fitting. And with this show, I wanted to kind of make people think twice about why they get a tattoo. You know, even though it's not permanent, you still, there's meaning behind it to each and every single individual person. So I obviously cut them, um, cut them out of the paper. I ordered them from a website called Sticker U, uh, which was a terrific website. They're great. A little bit on the pricey side um, per page, but Overall, I think it turned out to be a great product. And then this is my postcard and business card. And that is the final setup in the show. So I hope to see you all on the wild side sometime. And uh, next up is Abby Vowles. Like Tip said, my name is Abby Valls. Um, my piece is called Living in the Landfill, which is an upcycled piece, which means um, basically taking trash or um, products and making it into an actual usable item. Um, this upcycle came along a long time ago when I was younger. My family and I would go to the East Coast and pick up um, sea glass, which is seen here. Um, I had a lot of sea glass growing up and I didn't know what to do with it, so I started making jewelry out of it and actually selling it in my hometown. Um, during that process, I started learning a lot more about upcycling and a lot more about the world around us and what trash actually does. Um, here are some facts, not quite fun, but facts. Um, the average household throws away about 13,000 separate pieces of paper each year. Um, each ton, which is about 2,000 pounds of recycled paper, can save about 17 trees, 380 gallons of oil, and 250 pounds of carbon dioxide. Um, the UN claims that there is about 46,000 pieces of plastic each in each in each in every square mile of the ocean. Um, if everyone in the United States tried, tied together their annual consumption of plastic bags together, there would be a giant chain that would reach around the equator about 776 times. Um, each year, the United States consumes about 10 billion paper grocery bags, requiring about 14 million trees. Um, our trash gets sold to India and China. Um, this picture here is actually a picture in India. Um, India has run out of room uh, to keep their garbage, so they've actually, their farmland has actually become trash, and their cows and cattle has become living on it. They've um, started actually eating it as well. Um, so, <laughs> Not so fun fact again about decomposition. Um, it takes about one million years for a glass bottle to decompose. It also takes 600 years for a plastic bottle to decompose. It takes about 80 to 200 years for aluminum cans to decompose, 20 to 30 years for plastic film containers, and about one to five years for one cigarette butt. Um, so, continuing on, my project, my biggest inspiration was this man here, which looks goofy, but he actually is, lives in California, and he started going out and wearing this goofy-looking costume, trying to tell people 
how terrible plastic is for our world around us. Um, he also goes to companies, I don't think he does anymore because he got sued by a few companies, but he, goes to, he used to go to a few companies um, explaining what they're doing. Um, a big reason that companies don't do this or that don't listen um, is because we keep buying as consumers and whatever sells might as well make it. Um, another inspiration, huge inspiration on my piece is this movie called Plastic Paradise, which really opened up my eyes to what in the world we're doing. Um, Plastic Paradise actually talks about this place called the North Pacific, um, North Pacific Garbage Patch, which is starting to become no longer a uh, patch. It's almost becoming an island. And it's between Hawaii and Oregon. And here is a little clip about the movie. The problem is bad. Um, I really hope uh, to inspire other people to take our garbage away. Um, to quit consuming and start producing something that won't hurt the world. And I want to question you, what kind of beach do you want at the end? Um, please check out my piece in the gallery. Thank you. All right, so thanks to all of you for some great presentations. And now I'm gonna welcome you guys up here and open up the question and answer. If, uh, for the audience. But before we start uh, taking questions, we just want to ask from us, like, how do you guys see you guys' this project connecting with the overall theme of your, the name of the show, Passion and Profit? Uh, uh, well, I guess we started out um, with the um, Shell basically was like, figure out what you want to do and then get into this group and then figure out your thing. And one thing that we really noticed, and this is pretty much true with any graphic designer, is that you have this huge battle between passion as like a passion project or am I going to make money off of this? And so we really um, wanted to, we definitely showed that in all of our work. Is this going to be something we're going to sell? Or is this going to be something that's passion, or can it be both? Mm -hmm. yeah. That definitely, uh, you know, when we were coming up with the way to uh, name the show, we were all just saying, you know, what kind of projects we wanted to do, and like, first of all, which is what we were passionate about, because it's like if you're not passionate about what you're doing, then you shouldn't be doing it. And um, I think that really uh, hits home with me, because it's like I'm really passionate about finding meaning in life and like creating meaning and um, helping other people find their own meaning of like what they want to do with their life. So that just like, but it's tattoos. So obviously there's some sort of currency involved. Um, so it was like, you know, do I want to do this to get paid or do I want to do this because I want to help people? And yeah, definitely just helped hit that home. And another part of it too that you'll notice from the design that you've been seeing rotate through and then on the show going into the wall is actually kind of a little bit of a take on a Venn diagram. So kind of playing off of, you know, does it have to be one or the other or can it be both? Mm -hmm. so, is there anyone have a question for all this? <laughs> so your presentation, is that exactly what we're going to see over there? or? And it doesn't seem like it, that, that the, the show will be different from some of this? Yeah, um, a lot sense? of us just kind of wanted to allude to what we're showing in the gallery. Um, I want to give the secrets away. Yeah, of course, we don't <laughs> want to just show you. <laughs> no, that's fine. Because <laughs> I saw his already. Yeah, I can. Yeah. But there's, yeah. there's more to mine than just that picture. You gotta experience it. Yeah, you gotta just experience it. <laughs> How many tattoos do you have? Specifically, I have eight. Yes. I plan on losing count at some point. <laughs> Any other questions? No. All right, so let's... I do have a question. Yeah. Is it always obvious what you're passionate about? 
No. No, not really. No. What was that process like, sort of identifying where your passions were? I think deep down we kind of, like most of us, like take, you know, skiing, growing up, like a lot of it has gone kind of back to our childhood, <laughs> but I think really just, I think it's safe to say a lot of us were stumped. Shell just kind of gave us free reign and said, do whatever you want, and yeah, I was actually going to go a completely different direction, and then I was driving home with two cats in the car from winter break, and was like, you know what, maybe I should rethink this. Yeah. And at first, my, for mine, I knew that I wanted to do something with tattoos, but I wasn't sure, you know, I wanted to go, you know, all out and, like, actually tattoo people in the gallery as, like, a, as a performance piece, kind of, like, really crazy out there, you know, because why not? But, uh, obviously, you know, with liability and other things, for various reasons. Uh, but, yeah, but I, I like how it turned out. I really do. A lot of people have... Um, have stopped by and like wanted to get a tattoo and just or had no problem, especially since it's like something that doesn't hurt. You know, with, with tattoos, it's, it's like, oh, you get a tattoo, oh, it hurts, needles, eh. But if you get it, if you take that out of the equation, people are a lot more willing to tell you some, sometimes they're like deepest secrets because they, they pick a tattoo to symbolize something to them. So you find out like something about them without even knowing them. Which I think is really powerful. I think another thing is, is like a, a graphic designer, you're told to, um, once you get a real job, make sure that you have a passion project so you don't go crazy. And I think you just kind of grow up having a passion project, so you do stuff on the side. And this was our chance to be like, well, no longer passion project, here it is, we're gonna yeah. <laughs> throw it out there and actually make it known that this is what we do on the side. Mm -hmm. I actually had a question too for the uh, artists here. What are you planning on doing with your pieces after the show? Mm -hmm. Oh, where are you? I'm <laughs> <You're> just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I might just pursue um, creating like a side portfolio with more animations instead of just having my more straightforward graphic design portfolio. Maybe do a side website that just has strict animations since I'm kind of leaning more towards those. Um, for me personally, the first artist I mentioned, Jessica Hinch, actually a lot of her fame came from her side projects and posting those online. So. Um, I'm not completely sure on the resolution and whatnot, which is why I haven't widely spread it yet, but if you go to fosteringfelines.com, you can view my site. So eventually it's my goal to kind of have that look good on the actual web versus just in the gallery and hopefully spread it and see what opportunities come about based on that. I'd say for mine, um, it's pretty big. Mine is about like eight feet tall, so um, <laughs> I'll have to probably cut it down some, but I'll probably hang them on my wall and then try to continue to build bigger from that. I think for my pieces, I'm probably just going to either keep them or if anybody would like to talk about it, I may be willing to part with one. <laughs> talk to my guess. Um, probably just roll mine up, put them in my room somewhere. <laughs> but I also want to just keep developing the brand, just kind of as a side thing. No rush, really, but I don't know. It's just it's kind of a fun thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. This is a question more directly for Abby. How did you go about getting all the materials for you? Um, I panicked. I'm not going to lie. Michelle was like, there's no way you're going to find that many cans to make a dress. And I was like, yeah, I know you're right, but I'm going to do it. And um, <laughs> so I had like, I went to a house, a friend's house, and um, had asked them, you know, after a weekend's over, can I just come by and pick up your cans? And when I asked them that, I had no idea that I was going to get that. I had so many cans to the point where I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> and um, I initially, like, I, the first dress that I made, that that was going to be the way it was going to be, it was all going to be cans. And the other one was going to be all plastic. But I'm sitting there, it's like, I have so many cans, I don't know what to do. So I had to throw some cans on that one, too. And uh, still, like, I have scraps of I used it to decorate my piece in the gallery, but then I'm 
planning on and figuring out what else I can do with them and just the scrap metal and stuff like that. So just asking people, um, I don't personally drink pop and my roommates don't drink pop either. So it was hard to find cans in our house, but knowing that there's other people that have parties or whatever, <laughs> maybe yeah, I knew that there was going to be an opportunity. Um, with the plastic bags, we had a lot. Um, Walmart, one thing I noticed is like Walmart makes you take out plastic bags. And I think that's so dumb. Like I, I was going through the checkout, like the easy checkout, and I was like, oh, this is so cool, there's an easy checkout. But then they're like, you have to use this bag, otherwise we're going to yell at you and make you call somebody over so that they can fix the machine to understand that you're not going to put it in the bag. And I think that's so dumb. And you're walking away maybe with one product but you're putting that product that's probably wrapped in plastic in a plastic bag. So we had a lot. Same with paper bags. We had so many paper bags. We still have a lot of paper bags. So if anybody wants paper bags, they just please feel free. So yeah. I just um, have a question about it. Did, do you think doing this project raised your awareness? Like, did the amount of cans that you got, thinking that you wouldn't be able to find enough, was that, like, appalling, surprising to you? Yeah, um, during this project I was watching a lot of documentaries, which is super nerdy, but I like also learned from all these documentaries like more, um, just more about what we're doing to the earth. Uh, I took an energy class, which also last semester, which really caused a lot of awareness. Um, it just, it was a lot. It's, it's amazing what humans do and why we do it, I don't quite understand. And I still, I'm hoping that as designers, we'll think a little bit differently um, on what we're producing, so. I just have a question along the same lines with everybody. Do you feel like, you talked about these being like kind of a personal project or things on the side, things you're passionate about. Do you think by being able to do them and put them in sort of a social setting where other people can see them, do you learn more about what it is you're passionate about? Do you feel like you, gained more knowledge or focus because of this project? Or do you feel like it's stuff that you... I don't know. It kind of made me realize how much I know about things, this, this kind of stuff already. Um, yeah, that's about it. I think the one thing that at least I didn't account for was how much I would learn about like the different software that I was working with, yeah. um, which I can say it's fairly close across our materials or software. Mm -hmm. is just like... Some of them are ones we've used before, but you know, adding new things and just like when you're working that much, that in depth with that tool, how much you can really learn about it is interesting. I thought it was pretty nice too. Just like she was kind of saying, it's when you get that far into a program, like you can start learning all these new things that before, like you're doing projects for an assignment and you're just like, trying to do, trying to get it done. Now, but now like, you want to like make it look really nice or go a certain direction with it. So it's nice getting to do what you wanted to do and use the tool if you needed to. Yeah, I think that it pushes us a little bit harder as well because we don't have, they kind of leave it open so you kind of have to push yourself and make yourself go in certain directions that usually a teacher would make you do that. So I think it's, I think it's a good growing point for us as well. And to add to that just like kind of knowing when you're done with right, something yeah. that like yeah. I think really you push yourself more than for a class assignment just to, to get to where you want it to be. Question yeah, now that you've done this question is for everybody. Now that you've done this project for this particular class, how do you think this will impact how you would apply this in a in a business setting once you're in a job? That's a very good question. I think one thing that I've actually been interested in is like the user experience, so how people interact with things. And I've had a lot of experience like planning events and different things like that, but actually like doing it digitally and interactive like on a screen has been really interesting and thinking how people will use it and um, just hoping to move that, use those skills moving forward to hopefully get a job. Yeah, one thing Shell is, oh, I'm sorry, uh, one thing Shell is kind of stressed a little bit, um, or actually a lot, is when you're interviewing you want to show stuff, like what you're interested in, not only like design-wise, but what you're interested in outside of that. Um, and I, I know for me, I think for, kind of for everybody, honestly, in this group, we all kind of show something we're passionate about, and so now we can put this in our portfolio and 
start applying to places that have to do with that passion, you know, and that I think that looks really strong in a portfolio piece. Mm -hmm. I think that it'll help with the interviewing process as well because having a piece that you're really passionate about in your portfolio will just spark more conversations and it gets you a little bit more comfortable in the interview situation yeah. and things like that. And then as well, um, for mine being a physical like 3D piece, it kind of helped me um, realize how people interact with it and how you go around it, go through it and things like that. That's, those are things that I didn't think about when creating it, but when getting to the final stages of actually setting it up, I know we kind of went through a lot of renditions of how it should sit in the gallery and try not to block things, um, try not to block other artworks, whereas in like a store you wouldn't want to block the shoes that you're trying to display with the actual display. Uh, with mine, I guess, um, someone pointed out the idea of like putting a little corner in a tattoo parlor where it's like the kids, and if they bring their kids along, they can just give them give each other temporary tattoos. But I actually have the idea of if I were to start my own shop, actually, um, to kind of do like a try your own tattoo out for a while, like print off a temporary tattoo of what the person would want, put it on there, they can try it out for a couple weeks, see if they want to change anything and then come back and we'll make some changes and then eventually get the real thing. So kind of playing with those ideas of different, like how people can like, I don't know, use, use my ideas or use like things and just try and test it out so they get a better idea of the product that they want. So kind of like user experience, but a little different. Um, I guess for mine, uh, one thing should always start, when you start talking about um, when looking for a workplace, you want to make sure that you're in the right workplace. A lot of times people after school will go into like the first opportunity and I think that having this um, under my pants, I'm not going to go into packaging design that's designing plastics. I mean, it's just, it seems common sense, but I don't know. I think it, now that I've made something physical, it may be a lot stronger in understanding about So you're all in black. Is that? <laughs> it was kind of planned. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, but I just yeah. assumed that's what graphic designers do. <laughs> all black. Uh, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Every day. Every day. Just like this. Bow tie and everything. No more questions? I have a question specifically for Jake. Is like 3D printing the future of all board technologies? Is that like right now? Right? I don't think it's, it hasn't been realized. Uh, just because there's so many materials. I wish Andy was here. He's a <laughs> but he's in Arizona right now. He could tell you a lot more about it. I mean, maybe. I, I could definitely see it happening. <laughs> the best thing about those 3D printers is like the rapid prototyping idea where you yeah. Yeah. create a bunch of things mm -hmm. that actually have form and like volume and actually see how they work. But mm -hmm. and then like you can like print off like gun parts, like magazines and stuff, you can make your own, put into a gun, like they'll function. So I mean, there's there's things you can make <coughs> I think it's more for just like the getting ideas out and pumping them out. Yeah, it's more for prototyping at the moment yeah. rather than full functional. Yeah. Yeah. I know healthcare they started using it and actually like <coughs> yeah. 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 Yep. I've seen that. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.